Divide and rule. The strategy was most notably employed by the Roman and British empires. It is a political strategy where a tiny minority maintains its rule over an overwhelming majority by instigating or encouraging divisions among the majority, who otherwise would easily overthrow such rule were they able to unite against the rulers. Republicans and Democrats, as a matter of standard operating procedure, apply the strategy when they fan the flames of partisan division in our own society by continuously pandering to their base supporters. Since the overwhelming financing for both parties comes from the ruling political elite, the parties fan the flames of societal division at the behest of this elite. For if the ruling elite was opposed to divisions in society, they possess the financial power to stop the political parties from instigating it. In pursuing the common good, we cannot ignore this underlying reason for the partisanship pervading our society. So when we speak of a politics without partisanship, we are referring to the inherent unity that exists among the overwhelming majority of ordinary Americans who comprise somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the American population. But we are under no illusion that Americans can unite in harmony with those who are intent on gaming the system for selfish benefit through the dysfunctional behavior of special interest lobbying. Government policy has become so ensnarled with laws skewed to the benefit of political favorites that unwinding these snarls will involve unavoidable trade-offs, creating winners and losers. But we contend that when losing is simply nothing more than ceasing to be a political favorite and being once again subject to the laws like everyone else, then economic loss may actually confer the blessing of spiritual gain. Hence, the absence of partisanship should not be misconstrued as bereft of conviction or a reluctance to confront and challenge all those individuals and groups in American society successfully gaming the system to the detriment of the common good of the great bulk of the American people. This seeming contradiction between professed nonpartisanship and admitted political conflict should not be unfamiliar to anyone. The American experiment, infused from its beginnings and continuing throughout its history with Judeo-Christian thought, rests on a foundation that recognizes this dichotomy. Recall that the Jewish prophet and Christian way-shower who peacefully said, blessed are the peacemakers, and love your enemies, who instructed a disciple to refrain from violence and put up thy sword, and who in his story of the Good Samaritan expanded the definition of neighbor to include all humankind, was no shrinking violet when it came to passionately denouncing evil and injustice by saying seemingly contradictory things like, he that is not with me is against me, who divisively declared, I came not to send peace, but a sword who drove the money changers out of the temple with a scourge of small cords while overthrowing the tables, and who ignored any taint of political correctness by irreverently telling the scribes and Pharisees, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you, charging the Pharisees with devouring widows' houses and describing them as blind fools and serpents, vipers, who would not be able to escape the greater damnation of hell. As citizens of the United States, we are now also called to be sophisticated enough to make the same distinction of loving righteousness and hating iniquity, as St. Paul put it, or in the words of the 1844 poem, The Present Crisis, written by James Russell Lowell, Oft to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife with truth and falsehood for the good 
or evil side.